Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence uh, begins on a very boring note almost. It's a very slow novel uh, in, in the sense that it's uh, sort of a gauzy recollection. It is not that, well, it, the plot moves along pretty quickly and there's a lot of action for the characters, but it's a, uh, it is all seen through this kind of scrim of, uh, of memory. There's nothing very, for all the vividness, there's nothing all that vivid that, o that often happens. It's the, it's fairly dull people generally doing fairly dull things. Uh, this is Wharton remembering her life uh, of, uh, when she was growing up in New York in the 1870s, she says, uh, and she's writing it after the First World War when uh, I think she publishes it in 1921. So it is a very much a kind of a wistfulness of, uh, of a childhood with all the nostalgia and worldly perspective on that nostalgia that this implies in the aftermath of the, uh, the war. A lot of uh, modern notions started to creep in and realize that, oh, okay, we were kind of innocent back then. Uh, the the brutality of the First World War tended to strip away a lot of illusions of the politeness of human society in general, and you get a sense of the falsity of the uh, uh, of the topic of the of the of the society just in the very opening image, which is. On a January evening in the early 70s, Christine Nielsen was singing in Faust at the Academy of Music in New York. Uh, this is significant. This sets up a couple of things right there. It's a first line, and it might be like, huh, what, who? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's got some heft to it there. It's got some meat on the bone. Um, the early 70s. This is, for people who were reading it in the early 20s, obviously like a, you know, back in my day type of thing. So automatically, they're going to have to you know, go, transport themselves back to another time. Um, singing in Faust, Christine Nielsen. Christine Nielsen was a famous uh, uh, opera star of the time, a real person, and, uh, and an, an international star. So, and opera also, it's, it's very significantly a relatively uh, sophisticated world, a very cosmopolitan world that we're dealing with here. Uh, but also uh, other information in there. Faust is significant. It is the story of, uh, uh, of one man's uh, pursuit and desire for knowledge and the uh, the destruction he wrecks on uh, 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 on the on, on the world and the people he loves, uh, um, and most of all himself. He is ultimately uh, a victim of his own uh, lust for knowledge. Uh, and uh, the Academy of Music. The uh, well, the, the the question there gets down between the uh, and it gets developed in the next paragraph of the difference between the Academy of Music and the new Metropolitan Opera House. Um, the uh, the question of uh, the development of New York. The Academy of Music is downtown. It's where the uh, the established the the proper people uh, go get their entertainment, uh, and you know this isn't for that rowdy crowd at the Metropolitan Opera House, which is up uh, in in like the high 30s uh, or the or like 40th Street or something like that, which is considered like you know chaos up there. That's that's you know that's the wrong side of the tracks. Um, there's that sense of the newness coming in, the new money coming in specifically. This isn't necessarily, you know, people are going to the opera, they're not necessarily, you know, going to a barroom brawl or anything like that, but they are new money. You cannot perhaps get access to the, uh, the, the older venues, so they are developing their own, and this is exactly what happened. And so you're getting that presence or that pressure, that upward pressure of generational shift, uh, new money coming in, a world that is suddenly coming under some scrutiny, and the suggestion that, well, okay, uh, the, the proper people, the, the people that matter, uh, those are resisting some of these changes. And there is a, uh, there's a conflict there. There's a pressure there.
Uh, but all of this, okay, uh, ne necessarily puts a spotlight on the th on the fact that it is a theater. It is a world of performance. Uh, so there's a kind of meta reference here, where the uh, where the focus on the theater in the very first line, uh, the focus on the theater makes one think about performativity in general and the idea that perhaps everybody here and everything that that is going to follow that very first line. Uh, is about performance, uh, not necessarily about truth or actuality or sincerity or any of those, you know, polite terms, but about performing, performing your role, performing your character, uh, being or living to be seen and watched and observed by others. It's a, uh, a, a curious little uh, moment there. It also, however, does have a meta reference uh, to the artificiality of the novel itself. Um, literature is just another form of artifice. Literature uh, is a kind of performance. Uh, by casting it again, sort of like in the far distant past, you're already sort of put on guard. Well, is this a once upon a time story? How, uh, how innocent or how, you know, sentimental is this going to be? Uh, what is the relationship uh, of this narrator to the material, uh, which is very crucial. Uh, all of these, uh, all of these questions start surging in the very first line, and well, in that second paragraph as well, which talks a little bit about the uh, the advent of commercial cabs and how convenient they are, <laughs> as opposed to having your own car take you and pick you up and where you have to wait for it. And you know, there is all this notion of again the uh, the upward pressure of new money coming into a very rock solid establishment of so-called old New York. Um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a fairly, uh, a fairly sober tone to all this. Uh, it is very much a, uh, in a realist vein, which, uh, which, Wharton really works within uh, and, and which comes to us uh, a, an awful lot from and was the probably prevailing force of uh, American lit in the uh, in the 1870s. Very realistic uh, description. You get a real sense of the place. When Newland Archer opened the door at the back of the club box, the curtain had gone up on the garden scene. There was no reason why the young man should not have come earlier, for he had dined at seven alone with his mother and sister and had lingered afterward over a cigar at the Gothic library with glazed black walnut bowl cases and finial top chairs, which was the only room in the house where Mrs. Archer allowed smoking. You get the sense of the decor, uh, very specific references to the uh, to the the blazed black wall, the glazed <laughs> glazed black walnut uh, bookcases, um, that sense of uh, furniture. Quite frankly, uh, interior design. Wharton wrote a book about interior design. She was very into it, um, and and the sense that well, okay, these things that are there to be looked at. Uh, we should consider. We should. They have a, a an intrinsic beauty. They have an intrinsic value, and we should appreciate them. Which, of course, opens up the question of well, does that extend to the characters? Should we have the same focus on the, the human beings walking around as we are the furniture? The human characters are another kind of furniture in literature, quite frankly, and the 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 simple um, objective setting of the scene I think is important. Um, we're not taken like into Newland Archer's thoughts necessarily right here in this spot in this particular opening. We just see him as a human being and we get a lot of information in just a few lines conveying the sort of life he had. Enjoying his privileges and he knows what rules to follow and how to follow them. 
Uh, there is a room for smoking allowed for the gentleman, and he goes along with that. And that's kind of an important character trait. He uh, he observes the proprieties. He's not there to rock the boat. He's not going to just sit there, uh, walk into a house and say, oh, no smoking in here. Well, well I'm going to do it anyway. He's not going to put his feet up on the coffee table and light up a stogie, tipping the, uh, tipping the ashes on the rug. That's not him. He's going to respect the rules. Um, but within this, uh, the, the style of the writing is really very um, uh, curious at times. Uh, Wharton herself establishes a narrative voice that is uh, an insider. She knows all of the secrets. She knows all of the insider stuff. But she has a kind of wry detachment from it. Uh, you get this sense, and think about this from a reading public standpoint, when she is writing in the 20s, and there aren't that many, you know, uh, polite old New York people wandering around who are going to buy or read this book, but this is for a curious public. Think of, uh, think of a public that um, is infatuated with wealth and glamour and celebrity. Uh, you, you know, of course, those people don't exist in real life today. Uh, but she, from that, she is tossing out these little crumbs. This character of the narrator is saying, well, of course, it was like this and this. And of course, this, this gentleman had to do this and he had to do that. And it's all got this sort of inside vibe to it. It's got this real uh, almost gossipy tone to it. It's very knowing. It's very tasteful. But it's just she is giving you the insider person. There is within that a kind of uh, sense of uh, the exclusiveness of it. The within that ironic tone, that dry voice of uh, of, of of Wharton's uh, narrator. Um, she she constantly gives these little hints that there is a kind of insiderness to which. Even those people reading about it and getting all these secrets uh, will never really be able to uh, uh, to access. There's a certain coterie uh, element going on here that is, that is exclusive, and the nature of exclusivity is that it excludes. And who does it exclude? The reader. So the reader is kind of you know kept on the hook and not really certain of uh, their own status within this reading experience. Are they really on the inside? Is Wharton, the narrator, really on their side? Uh, how should they take this? The, uh, the position of the reader is really very unstable. And that's, that is a result of the, uh, the writing always sort of suggesting that you know a little something, but no, there's a lot that you don't know and that you can't know because you're not one of us. This comes out when uh, they start talking about, uh, about uh, one little element in, in that first chapter about uh, the opera itself. Um, uh, as, as Newland Archer is sitting there and listening, and he's gazing indolently, lazily, uh, across the theater at uh, at a box on the other side uh, of the of the theater, where he sees his uh, May Welland, who will who will learn is his fiance, uh, and uh, May's mom and aunt. Uh, and they're there all dressed up and May is, you know, sitting there like she's surrounded by flowers, lots of flower imagery. She is pure. She is innocent, uh, like the title. Um, she is somewhat delicate uh, and uh, also largely ornamental like flowers. But Newland is sitting there and, and he's listening uh, to the music. And uh, we get the um, we get uh, the narrator coming in. She sang, of course, "Mama," which and not "He loves me," since an unalterable and unquestioned law of the musical world required that the German text of French operas sung by Swedish artists should be translated into Italian for the clearer understanding of English-speaking audiences. <laughs>
<laughs> which is funny. Um, it's a good line, and uh, you know, it shows that it shows that Wharton has a little sense of humor. But you, you just look at the the comedy and how it works there, in that uh, it is sort of absurd. Um, but there's also kind of a snide cosmopolitanism going on there. Uh, we're reminded that, you know, only a very select few people can understand this. Uh, you need to understand that uh, ma'amma means in Italian, he loves me. But for an English speaking audience hearing that, it would sound like mama, uh, mama, mommy. Uh, that is not the same thing. A cultivated and educated and inside type person, a sophisticated cosmopolite, if you will, would understand all those little subtleties, would be able to read all of those little subtleties and interpret them in the full expanse of possibility that ordinary audiences just can't. So here, she's reminding the readers that there's an awful lot going on here that you know, you're know you just not gonna get, uh, which is a bold thing to say <laughs> for a writer to say on like page two of, uh, of a novel, you know, telling your audience, you know, you're, you're not smart enough to keep up with this. Uh, that's, that's gutsy, but it's also a little bit of a challenge and it keeps the narrator in a uh, kind of liminal space would be the word, I guess, between the uh, uh, between the readership and the characters in the world of the novel. Uh, the the narrator is providing a is acting as an interlocutor, um, providing a, a venue, a, a viewpoint on that world. Uh, but at the same time, she's sort of straddling the two. She's not part of either. Uh, and that, again, is like a destabilizing element. We're not quite sure how to take any of this. Um, a, uh, you know, a, uh, a good narrator from just a couple generations before, you know, opens up with one, uh, once upon a time and you always know exactly where you are with that narrator. Uh, well, with that world. The narrator seems to know everything. The narrator is confident, and the narrator guides you through it as an ally. Here, we're, we're going through this inferno with a Virgil with a little bit of a tood, and we're not quite sure how to take it. You're never sure what reality you're looking at. No expenses have been spared upon the setting. This setting is the novel or the stage. It's a little unclear when it just comes up like that, which was acknowledged to be very beautiful even by people who shared his acquaintance with opera houses of Paris and Vienna. The foreground to the footlights was covered with emerald green cloth, the middle distance symmetrical mounds of woolly green moss bounded by croquet hoops formed the base of shrubs shaped like orange trees but studded with large pink and red roses, gigantic pansies considerably larger than the roses and closely resembling the floral pen wipers made by female parishioners for fashionable clergymen sprang from the moss beneath the rose trees. And here and there a daisy grafted on a rose branch flowered with, luxur with a luxuriance prophetic of Mr. Luther Burbank's far-off prodigies. So here we're focusing on flowers, we're focusing on May Welland and her association with flowers. The flowers are on the stage, May is associated with flowers, she is watching the stage, and here we have Newland Archer just sort of glancing back and forth between them, wordlessly, silently, just contemplating his future. We considering like, well, you know, what kind of a wife is she going to be to me? We're going to have a good life together. She's going to be a, uh, a good uh, ornament on my arm. She, uh, she, you know, she will, uh, she will allow me all my little, uh, um, 
uh, habits. She will cooperate with me. She'll be smart, but not too smart. Smart enough. The society at the at the time, Newland Archer is very concerned that well, okay, you know, uh, on my honeymoon, I'm going to take literature and I'm going to read the classics to her, and you know, I'm going to read. I'll read Faust to her so that she understands some of what she is watching tonight. Uh, you know. <laughs> can't wait to go on my honeymoon so I can read. Uh, that tells you a little something about the character, but also of the values that he holds. Reading and reading poetry specifically um, is considered uh, uh, masculine. And he drops that word repeatedly, uh, or the narrator drops that word repeatedly, the masculine virtues. Um, gender is a part of that. Uh, but also of uh, but also there are, there's there's a conflict in there of wealth a binary uh, opposition of, uh, of wealth uh, that gets implied with all that there is a repeated concern with uh, masculine values and we're introduced to a pair of uh, of the men of the uh, the uh, uh, they are great uh, experts in uh, the, uh, what is it, the one of form and the other of family. Uh, and those words are put in quotation marks, which automatically set them off. You know, you know, what's, why is that in quotation marks? That's kind of weird. Why would you quote that? So, it, so you're getting a sense of like the, uh, the oddness of those words. Uh, you know, imagine putting air quotes on something. It makes it seem odd. It makes it seem peculiar. And here you have actual quotes making those words seem odd because in as you read you realize form and family really just stands for uh fashion and gossip uh the one guy uh what's his name leland um is a, a, a lefferts rather lefferts uh lefferts is a uh, an expert in form and he always knows you know when you have to wear a black tie versus a white tie or something i guess uh and he always knows exactly like how to uh, how to sit and, you know what to do and you know uh, all of these things of uh of fashion of clothing and behavior all very outward things uh and and he, you get the sense he's really quite the dandy uh, and then you also get the, uh, uh, oh God, I'm bad with names, Sillerton Jackson, great name. Uh, Mr. Sillerton Jackson is said to be a great expert on family, and he can look around and see uh, and recognize everybody and know them down to levels of cousinhood or whatever the term is that uh, she used, cousinships, New York's cousinships. Everybody who comes to town is related to somebody else. Everybody needs to be identified through that. And this vast matrix of society, high society, is very complex and very convoluted and often involves people from, you know, all over the country and Europe as well, coming to visit New York, the rising metropolis. Uh, so he is apparently an expert in knowing all of those details, but not just the details of who is who and who is related to whom, but also the dirty secrets. Uh, he knows, you know, about the illicit affairs and the unfortunate financial arrangements and some of the little circumstances that arise here and there that get people wagging. And of course, he keeps absolute secrecy, we're told, in these things but only out of self-interest because he says that uh, uh, because we are told by the narrator that the uh, that he knows that his trustworthiness in learning any of this information is related to his ability to hold on to the information so you get a couple of things there you get a sense of privilege and being very protective of his privilege you get a sense of the bitchy gossipiness of uh, everybody out there and also it, it, it's got to be said that uh, these two characters, these two uh, male uh, characters who are seen almost as like guard dogs of society telling you what is right and what is wrong uh, and presumably being, you know, a little imposing in that, you know, form and family. They're just a couple of gossipy and, you know, 
bitchy uh, paradigms, the characteristics they are exercising of, uh, you know, talking, uh, talking illicitly behind someone's back or knowing all of this juicy gossip or being so concerned with how pretty something is or how fashionably you're dressed and all of that stuff. These are, it has to be said, characteristics of women conventionally, stereotypically. Wharton is taking that, Wharton, a female author, is taking that and flipping it on its head. Women are supposed to be, well, they're, they're always concerned with the silly stuff and, you know, not masculine stuff like reading serious epic poetry and, 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 and stuff like that. Here, she's just saying that, well, no, the men are just as silly as the women, if not more so. And that's a nice little reversal there. That's a nice little twist. The, um, the, uh, it, it, it gives a distinctly, uh, um, feminine tint to that world, that world of performance, that world of exterior um, and uh, cosmetic often appearances. Excuse me, where we're watching this performance, we're watching all of this performativity, and we see uh, very little actually happening in those first lines. And we're just getting a sense of the value system that is being embodied here. The, uh, the characters and their essence in this world. Newland Archer. New, new land. You, you can go on about that. A lot has been written. Uh, Archer. You know, how many archers have there, have there been? You know, Apollo and, you know, whatever. We're not going into names just yet. Uh, well land too. But Newland Archer is a very conventional person. He's a very staid person. He is old money. He's resistant to anything new, any innovations, uh, new money, you know, to say nothing of actual poor people. Uh, but he is very protective of his privileges. He is very conscious of his appearance. And he's aware of the performative obligation on him. All he really aspires to do is be a figure in society, to function in that world, which means to be seen, to be out at the opera, to have a uh, attractive ornament on his arm that compliments him more than anything, uh, to exist in that world that is all exterior. And it's only when we get a sense of all that, that we can understand the seismic um, shock that comes when a newcomer appears in the box across the theater with May and her mom and aunt. And, every, you know, Lefferts and Jackson just go, oh, my God, you know, oh, my, 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 my. and they're shocked to see this woman who's dressed in a particular way that draws attention, who is perhaps a little notorious. Jackson supposedly knows everything and everybody's little dark secrets. Uh, we are kept on the outside at this point. We are not given a name at this point. We are not really brought into those worlds. The people in that world know the stuff we don't. And Wharton says, hold on, you don't know that yet. Maybe you could find out in time, but for right now, no, you don't know. Accepting that is part of the problem. Not accepting that is the challenge. The mysterious stranger uh, exacts a resistance mysterious stranger prompts shock 